Greetings, everyone. My name is Emily Louie, and on behalf of Campbell and Company, I would like to welcome you to Fundraising Communications for Campaign Case Development and Communications, the fourth webinar in our free fundraising communication series. Thanks so much for joining us today. Before we begin today's presentation, I'd like to quickly go through some logistics for those of you who may be new to our webinars. First, please close any programs other than GoToWebinar that are running on your computer. Next, we recommend calling in with the telephone instead of using your computer speakers. And please move your cell phone away from your computer. If you do experience any visual issues, please send a chat to Campbell and Company or contact GoToWebinar at the number on your screen. Today's webinar will last 60 minutes and you'll earn one continuing education credit that is good with your participation with CFRE International. Within the next 24 hours, you'll receive an email from GoToWebinar that includes information on how to download your certificate. In that same follow-up email, you'll also receive a link to download today's slides along with a link to the recording. We do welcome questions throughout the webinar, so please use the questions box in the GoToWebinar control panel that should be on the right side of your computer screen. We will also hold time at the end of the webinar for Q&A. Now I'd like to turn it over to Campbell and Company's Director of Communications Consulting, Andy Brommel. Hi, folks. I'll just plug this microphone in for a second. All right. Well, uh, welcome to the fourth and final webinar in this year's uh, Fundraising Communications webinar series. Uh, I'm Andy Brommel, coming to you live from, uh, from Chicago this time, from, from home. Um, strange circumstances, my friends. Uh, but one thing I've really missed in all of this is uh, having people over. So. I guess we have, you know, a nice uh, couple hundred nonprofit professionals uh, over over to the home today. So I uh, hope you're all hanging in there, and staying safe. Um, so this today's webinar is part of our fundraising communications series, which we created a few years ago to address some of the challenges that we see organizations facing. Uh, the series really arises from the recognition that fundraising is communications it's you know it's finding an audience communicating a message to them that inspires them to take action if you take the communications out of fundraising all you're left with really is, is a database and maybe some, some recognition tchotchkes so fundraising is communications every fundraiser is a communicator um, you know whatever your role is you're you're helping communicate a message but most people in our field don't really have enough time or support or resources to help them in their communications roles. There's a small subset of organizations that have a dedicated uh, development communications staffing. There's another group that have, you know, fundraisers trying to get things from the marketing team and like 70% of the time that's kind of fraught. <laughs> um, and then a lot of you are just out there with no support. So we created this series to try to um, provide some guidance and some resources uh, to help you feel more comfortable and confident in communicating the case for your organizations. The series, uh, as I mentioned, today is the last one in the series we've been doing over the last year, back to last fall. Um, if you can remember 2019, it feels like a, another lifetime, but uh, these, all of four of these sessions, they, they sort of build on each other and uh, they're all archived on the Campbell and Company YouTube channel. So if you missed the first three sessions, uh, feel free to go check those out. Um, don't worry if you didn't catch them. Uh, nothing in today's session will be utterly mysterious without having attended those. And again, the point of all of this is to help you get more effective and comfortable and confident in expressing your organization's philanthropic message. Uh, as Emily mentioned, we want you to ask questions. We uh, will have uh, some time for, for Q&A at the end. I think that might be a little extra important this time. So uh, please take advantage of that through the GoToWebinar uh, question thing. So to get into today's session, I want to start by just stepping back and, you know, acknowledging and reflecting on what does it even mean to be talking about this topic in the middle of a global pandemic? when all of our work, our missions, our families, our lives, all, all of this has been kind of turned on, on its head. So, you know, it feels a little strange, but we're gonna press ahead. Um, I, I wanna start by just thanking you for your work and your mission. Um, it's a tremendous privilege 
for us as consultants to get to work with nonprofit professionals and the missions that they support. We've got kind of a front row seat to all the ways that organizations across the country are trying to step up, to hang in there, to survive, to pivot, to be there for their communities, even if their resources are in question. And we're just seeing things every day that are incredibly inspiring. And um, so if you're on this call, I just want to say thank you. Um, I recognize that whatever you're doing is probably a, a little bit extraordinary and probably very challenging. So uh, if no one said thank you to, to you for that today, now some weird guy on the internet has. Um, we are collecting and sharing everything that we're hearing from across the sector. You can go to the Campbell and Company COVID-19 resource page, keep adding stuff to it. There's at this point probably about a dozen webinars on there that speak to uh, what we're seeing in fundraising, communications, uh, hiring and staffing from our executive search team. Uh, we have some general purpose webinars, a number of blog posts and resources, and then we have a bunch of um, sector specific webinars. So for higher ed, for professional associations, you name it. If you're in the nonprofit sector, there's a webinar there that's probably speaking fairly directly to you. Uh, so we're gonna keep adding to that. We hope you'll check it out. You know, we're, we're just collecting what we're hearing, we're synthesizing it, we're sharing good ideas. This is where we're all kind of working without a map here. Um, every organization's situation is unique. I, I can't tell you exactly how you should pivot your casework or your campaign uh, without getting really deep in with you and learning your situation. Uh, but in, in a lot of cases, what's being affected is the timing of campaigns. Um, and there is a bit of opportunity in that potentially if your timing is extended you you might be able to use that time to do a little bit more work on your case this is one of those things that we're always hearing organizations uh struggle to find the time for and it's casework and working on your messaging it's so important but sometimes it's the thing that gets squeezed out because it's not usually urgent next day kind of thing um so if you have some time really think about whether you might use some of that to come out of the other side of this with a really compelling uh, case and messaging. And if you already have a case or you're early in your campaign, um, at least think about revisiting the messaging. And, um, you know, the, the, we're, we're seeing that even some of the work that we have in process already starts to look and feel different. We were presenting two campaign names, actually three campaign names yesterday to, uh, uh, to a university client of ours. And, you know, we had one campaign name concept that I think probably would have been the winner uh, two months ago, but it, it was more of a challenge to the university community. And this other concept that's much more of a positive, just feel good, we're all in this together kind of message, that is really feeling right to them in this moment. So it's been interesting to see how even if the core substance of your campaign isn't changing, if you're not switching up the projects or the actual details of it, the messaging is going to feel very different based on where everyone's at right now. Finally, if you do have to prioritize and really you know, focus your resources and your, and your time, you're not gonna be maybe spending a bunch of money on campaign materials, really focus on the messaging. That doesn't cost necessarily anything um, to, to, to really take that to the next level. And try to focus on coming out of this with at least one good donor cultivation piece. Um, and we'll share a link at the end of this session to another webinar where we go through all the different types of donor cultivation materials that might be good to have. So just some quick thoughts. We can come back to this in the Q&A, but I didn't want to go barreling into this webinar without acknowledging where we are and just what a strange moment it is. Um, and I want to share three commitments from our communications team, which um, I have the, the, the honor of uh, uh, being part of this communications team where we have uh, uh, nine professionals within Campbell and Company who really focus on campaign case development and communications. And we've been thinking about what it means for us to do this work in this time. Uh, first, we're going to keep working to support your philanthropic visions. Uh, feel, like, like I said, it feels strange to do this session today, but at the same time, we believe that your organization is going to survive and thrive. We know you're going to need to do campaigns. So we want to keep doing the work to equip you for that. Second, uh, we're going to share as much as we possibly can this year. And, uh, you know, we do these webinars. I love them. It's, it's a great, you know, it's, it's fun to share uh, four or five times a year, kind of these synthesis of, of what we've been working on and how we're thinking. But for a while, I've wanted to do something much bigger. Uh, and it feels like maybe now's the time. So 
uh, starting in May for every week of this year, the rest of the year, we're going to put out a new article or blog post um, probably every Tuesday for the rest of the year, just sharing bit by bit as much as we possibly can. We're going to try to give away the store. Um, we're going to have posts about the different elements of a case for support, about making the case for endowment, capital projects, programmatic funding, um, you know, how to come up with a good campaign name, different kinds of campaign visions, all these different things. We're just going to start rolling that out every week um, in the hopes that it might be of use. And um, you'll hear from me in that. You'll hear from other voices on our team. So look for a sign up that we'll send out after this webinar, uh, probably next week where you can sign up to opt in to receive those every week and we'll also be sharing uh sharing them through our various company channels and third we're here to you we're here to talk through your questions so uh right now campbell is doing uh free you know 30 minute calls for for really anyone in the nonprofit sector who wants to talk um talk to us in communications talk to our fundraising team talk to our executive search team whatever kinds of questions you have so please feel free to reach out okay Ah, enough COVID stuff. Um, <laughs> let's dive in. Uh, it, it feels weird. It's like we're only like a month or so into this. I'm already just sick to death of coronavirus. Uh, let's talk about campaigns. So first of all, what makes a campaign case different than an annual or general case? If you've been following along our previous webinars, we've been really focusing on case in a very general sense. But when you are going into a campaign, there are some distinct advantages and challenges. Um, campaigns have some advantages from a case development standpoint. Typically, the vision is much bigger and more exciting. You're going beyond business as usual to bring forward ideas that are really compelling, things that have the power to transform your mission. There's the urgency of the moment. Campaigns bring urgency to giving. Um, th that sense of a once-in-a-generation opportunity, that's a strength. It makes your messaging more powerful. Um, typically, campaigns have really cool projects within them. You're funding cool things that, that, you know, are exciting to donors. So you've got a lot to work with on the advantage side, but there are also some challenges from a messaging standpoint. Um, you're asking people to go above and beyond with their giving. Whatever they've been giving you every year, you're going to ask them to do that, plus, you know, typically twice as much for a period of, you know, maybe a three or five year campaign pledge. So. If you're going to ask people to do that, you really uh, have to you really have to have a strong message. Uh, second, campaigns are in, are typically more volunteer driven than ordinary day to day fundraising, and that means it's not just you out there speaking. You need volunteers to feel comfortable carrying your message. Uh, that case, that messaging, it's in a lot of different hands now, and um, that we we know that's a challenge, and we know that volunteers need some help and support from us. Finally, too many cooks in the kitchen. When you're taking a campaign name or a campaign message through the, you know, review by committee with uh, your staff and some program staff and your leadership and a campaign committee and your board, uh, and everybody's got their hands on it, um, there's a, it can be really hard to keep a clear, distilled, um, powerful idea. Things get watered down, they get pulled in too many different directions. So. It's a real challenge as you go through this work. One of the things that, um, you know, really one of the core uh, pieces of work that our firm is doing all the time with organizations are campaign feasibility studies and planning studies. So we're all out there all the time, you know, testing campaign ideas with donor communities. And here are some of the most common uh, pieces of challenging feedback that we hear around the case. People will say, oh, that's a nice vision, but I, I'd need to see the details. So it feels too, uh, too uh, lofty and fuzzy. Or they might say uh, on the flip side, you know, these seem like good projects, but you know, what's special about this? What's the vision? Or they might say, uh, you know, this seems good, but what's really gonna be different? Isn't this just kind of doing more of what you already do? Um, or they might just say, you know, oh, uh, this is nice, but I'm going to keep giving at my current level. And uh, this is the one that actually really hurts us is, oh, I didn't read it. You know, oh, I didn't read the case that you sent me. So, you know, a, a lot of what we're going to talk about today is trying to respond to these kinds of challenges. And what's interesting about these, it, it, you don't, they're, they're all kind of positive, but dismissive. You know, it's not like people 
you know, it's not like people are digging into your case and like arguing against it. It's more like they're just kind of waving it away um, or saying that's nice, but I don't think I'm going to do anything special in this campaign. So that's a good clue with, with the case for support. You know, the, the bad situation, the, the death is usually more a kind of like friendly dismissal or deflection than it is like an outright rejection. Ultimately, what we're getting at here is, is frankly, that the, the case is what makes a campaign a campaign. It's a, a way of taking some, some projects or priorities and packaging them together into a larger vision and a more complete story. So, uh, and relying on the power of that story to inspire donors to give much more than they, they were before. So, if you don't have a strong campaign case, you really don't have much of a campaign. So what goes into shaping that case? If you've been following our previous webinars, you'll recognize this six element structure. Uh, these are the six basic ingredients to a case for support. I won't go into them in depth, uh, but every case is typically like a recipe made in some unique way out of these six ingredients. And there are three of them that matter the most in a campaign setting. There are three basically, of the six, there are three that really make it like make it campaigning, and that's the impetus, the vision, and the plan. Uh, basically, why is it urgent that we do something bigger? What is the bigger idea that we're going to do? And how is our, what is our plan to get it done that feels credible and ready for donor investment? If you can get that core of the campaign case working, you're probably in pretty good shape. So that's what we're going to talk about today. The rest of this presentation is organized around these three elements. I want to talk about first, what is the impetus in your campaign case? Remember when we look at the six elements, the impetus is the thing that's making it feel urgent and timely. Uh, this is the, the element that has to do with time, urgency, and the sense of moment. A campaign must feel like a decisive moment. And uh, you have to kind of think about what you're asking your donors to do. So here we're, um, you're challenging your donors to kind of overcome the inertia of, of, of their existing giving behaviors. Uh, so here we're taking our inspiration from uh, Sir Isaac Newton and the first law of motion. Uh, I just can't get over this guy's beautiful hair. Um, an object at rest will stay at rest and, to, and an object in motion will stay in motion uh, until a force acts upon it. So people are going to keep doing whatever they've been doing. If they've been giving $1,000 a year, that's what they're going to keep doing. If they don't give to you, they're going to keep on not giving to you until you reach them with some kind of new force or impetus that would change their behavior. So if someone's been giving you, you know, $1,000 a year for the last five years, what would make them give, uh, sign on for a $10,000 campaign pledge to pay basically double their annual gift over the next five years? You know, why would somebody do that? Uh, that's what the impetus in your campaign is trying to develop. So uh, let's share some approaches to that. How do you create urgency and a sense of impetus and moment around your campaign? There are many ways to do this. We're going to share three broad categories. The first is a threat-based framing. This is very straightforward. You know, unless we act today, this critical ecosystem will be lost forever. Uh, the second one may be more of an opportunity framing. Uh, this is a once in a generation chance to take our mission to a whole new level. Third framing, uh, which might be a little less familiar, is more of a, a moral responsibility framing. Every generation has stepped up to protect our national parks and now it's our turn. So these are just, we're, we're going to share a hundred different little bite-sized examples throughout this, uh, this presentation. These are all from different campaigns. Um, a couple things I would point out about these. Every one of them could be right. Every one of them could be viable. They all create a sense of urgency. They uh, all use time language. Uh, today, once in a generation, um, now it's our turn. This is, you know, it's, if you step back and look at campaigns and campaign names, they almost always have time language in them. Talking about the future, talking about tomorrow, you know, our past, our present, our future. Uh, campaigns need to create that sense of moment, and you see that in the actual time language that you use. The other thing that's interesting about these, and I made them different colors because they kind of set the color or the tone for your case. Um, how you frame the impetus determines a lot of the emotional 
coloring of, of how your campaign is going to feel, whether it's threat-based, opportunity-based, or more responsibility-driven. And the other thing that's interesting when you look at these is you, this is not like, a, the impetus for your campaign is not like given. Um, this is a decision that you actually have to make, and you can make it different ways. So let's take a look at how you could actually have the very same campaign, but frame the impetus for it in different ways. So uh, this is for a, for a media, a public media organization. You could do a threat-based framing. Quality local journalism has never mattered more or faced greater challenges. You feel the threat of that. Um, you could do an opportunity-based framing for the exact same thing. Today we have the chance to tell more stories from more voices in more ways to serve our community as never before. So, you know, it's kind of a question of what story do you want to be telling? Do you want to be talking about threats? You know, uh, maybe you're in a town where one of the main newspapers is shut down and the others really cut back. Um, coverage of local and state politics is getting really thin. People are losing trust in journalism. There's always threats to, to quality journalism, but it's really important for democracy and society. So there's a threat we need to respond to, uh, or maybe it's more of an opportunity framing. And uh, again, there's no right answer, um, but it's setting the emotional tenor of the campaign. So uh, let's look at the same, uh, same kind of thing for the opportunity and responsibility framings. I wanted to show a responsibility framing because I think this is a little less familiar, but sometimes the sense of moment and urgency is coming from really more of a moral sense or a sense of, of, of responsibility. So let's say the opportunity framing is if we take action today, we can make a difference for a whole generation of children um, versus a responsibility framing that might be more like you know, how we respond in this moment will reveal who we are and what our values me. So you feel morally summoned by that. So these are all just different options, different ways of approaching it. But every campaign needs something like this that feels like it's the spark or the, the, the kind of the driver. The natural question that comes up is, uh, can you do more than one? Uh, and of course you can. I mean, there's no, the like campaign case police aren't going to come and arrest you if you do. Uh, I think it's I think it's worth being intentional about what you're doing, uh, and especially if you are trying to sort of have it all three different ways, you might end up with kind of a wishy-washy mess where it's not clear what the real um, what what the real urgency is, and it feels like it's sort of uh, changing emotional tenors, or you're you're coming at it from too many different angles at once. Um, in particular, what, what can be valuable when you're trying to combine these is to go from a threat to op an opportunity or go from a threat to a responsibility. A lot of research on persuasion and messaging shows that people respond best ultimately to aspirational and positive feeling messaging, especially, I think that, that feels especially true right now when people feel there's so much in our lives that we don't control and that we are worried about. If, if somebody can give us a credible path to feel good about something, um, we need that. So uh, it, it, there's, a, I think, a pretty well-established practice of really hitting a threat or based urgency, but then moving to a, to a you know, starting with threat and moving to the hope. So that can be a, a nice way of balancing these. The thing to keep in mind is that someone is going to ask, so what or why now? This is like a classic board member or high level donor question to ask. And like you in the staff or we as, you know, working with you in the staff, we've all been getting really excited about this really great campaign case that we're telling and we're, we're really too close to the project and we're too close to it and we are so bought in, we think it's great. And then we put together this case that's all about how smart and great these projects are. And then we go to the board or go to a donor, we make our case and then they say, oh, that's all nice, but so, so what? Or like, why, why now? What's the urgency? Like this is one of the most predictable questions you'll face. So, uh, and it's sometimes easy to overlook if you're too close to the material and you're too bought in on it yourself. So uh, it's just a good reminder. Don't get caught with your, it feels really bad to get caught with your pants down with this question, um, no matter how smart your case is. So that's why we think about the impetus. 
The second major element we want to focus on is the vision in your campaign. This is maybe the most important and the trickiest aspect of a campaign case because it's just essential. Uh, campaigns are built around visionary giving. And that means you need a clear and strong campaign vision. We're asking donors to imagine something that is just out of the realm of their normal year-to-year -year giving. And we're asking them to buy into that and invest in it. And if you, that hinges on your ability to paint a really clear picture of what the world is going to be like on the other side of this campaign and why that is uh, so important and essential. So uh, this is, you know, of all the things you might do in your campaign, this is probably the place to spend the most time. And it's funny because it's the shortest. Like this, is, this boils down to a single sentence. If you spent 40% of your time just really trying to get that one sentence right, um, that's probably smart. So let's talk about what does a campaign vision do? Um, what are we going for? What is the mark of a successful campaign vision? It, it captures what will be different. Uh, so that might be, you know, we'll create a community where no child goes hungry at school. When you hear that, you can picture the world today and you can picture the world after that vision is achieved and it captures what will be different. A good campaign vision also distinguishes the campaign from your annual message. This is uh, especially important when you have, want people to keep giving to your annual fund. You need to be really clear about uh, what is going, why this is above and beyond. Um, this is what elevates your campaign above that day-to-day -day fundraising message. So let's say, for instance, you're a school or a college or university or something. So your annual fund message is about investing in everything that makes the school great today and sustaining good things today for your student or your, your kid today. Um, that's the day-to-day -day annual fundraising message. Then your campaign message might be more looking to the next generation. This is about securing uh, the XYZ sample school experience for a new generation of students. You need to draw a clear dividing line between the day-to-day -day giving and the campaign giving. Uh, and finally, a good campaign vision makes the projects feel like they add up to something greater. And this is important because if you go out there with a campaign that feels like it's a, a, a sort of a laundry list of projects, like a every, you know, just everything and the kitchen sink thrown in there. Donors will see that and they'll call you on it. Um, it's especially important if your campaign is a collection of, of disparate projects. So here's an example from an art school, uh, a college of art and design. This was a campaign where, frankly, the list of projects was pretty enormous and kind of boring like they were it was a bunch of endowed funds for scholarships faculty support they weren't doing anything flashy they weren't building any new buildings they weren't launching new programs this was really about reinforcing the core of the school through endowment and through their first significant endowment campaign so what do you do with a campaign where the projects are kind of like a little bit like eat your vegetables um you have to find that vision that elevates it and synthesizes it together. And where we landed with this campaign was that it was really about attracting the most creative people in the world to make their careers in our city, whether that's students coming here and being able to come here because a scholarship makes that possible, or faculty who can are the best in their fields and the most visionary artists. They can go work anywhere. They can go teach anywhere. What can we do that would make them choose our city? Um, so, you know, the projects are still the projects, but there's a vision that lifts them up. So it's important, um, but this is one of those things that's uh, hard to do well, even though it's not that, it's like, it's like walking on a tightrope. Like it's not that complicated to describe, but it's really hard to do. Um, so when we work with organizations, this is the piece that we often spend the most time on. So let's talk about, you know, how do you create an inspiring vision that's authentic to your organization? Uh, helpfully, uh, you don't have to do it all one way. There are, a, a vision can take many forms and there are, uh, it can use different kinds of language and different kinds of construction. Uh, and there are a lot of different ways to do this that could work for your organization. Let's show some examples. So some campaign visions work really well by being uh, really off the ground, really idealistic and lofty. 
uh, example here. If we went back to that public media example, the campaign vision might be about supporting the media that sustains democracy or fuels democracy. So, I mean, that's, that's big picture. Uh, that's very, you, you feel like your ideals and what you value as a person is kind of being summoned forward by that. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, it can be very concrete and pragmatic. Vision doesn't mean you need to talk in like big, you know, lofty rhetoric. You can actually be extremely concrete and be extremely visionary. Uh, so an example here, we're going to give a thousand more residents per year a place to call home. That's extremely concrete. It's committing to a number. Let's say this is an organization that has uh, a really valuable uh, homelessness prevention program that currently reaches 500 or 1,000 people. And we're saying, we've proven that it works. Now we're going to double it or triple it. That's, that's visionary. It's not lofty and you know rhetorical. It's just very concrete and pragmatic. This can be thinking about more of like a fundamental shift. So uh, example here, we're going to go from training people to get a job to training them to build a career. If the core of your campaign is some rethinking or pivoting of how you do your work, uh, that can be the visionary idea. And it can be, you know, also about building on success. So let's say, uh, you know, you are like, you are the... Um, you know, the uh, sort of leading regional theater in your community, and it's time to build a new building. And um, really the vision is, is to make sure that your city has a world-class theater for another 100 years. So it could be just, even if it's really kind of a continuation, there are ways of extending that out that make it feel visionary by building on success. Uh, campaign visions usually, uh, of all the things in a case, these are the ones that you most, this is the part that you most want to try saying out loud and seeing what it sounds like because um, it's a really good test. If it only works on, on the page, it probably isn't quite there yet. So uh, a good campaign vision is concise. Uh, example, we must make our campus, our campus reflect and support who we are as a school. So let's say this is a school that's raising money for a bunch of building projects, and they've got a whole master plan. There's lots of details. You, before you get all bogged down in talking about all the, all the details of the project, just step back and say something concise. Uh, you know, it's about elevating our campus so it reflects and supports who we are as a school. Uh, it should be memorable, easy to remember. Uh, let's say your vision could be, uh, we're going we're gonna to go from addressing homeless, homelessness to preventing it. That's interesting. That would be one of those like fundamental shift type campaign visions. And a good test for this kind of vision is to think, would any one of your board members chosen at random, if you had a little camera on them and they were off at some party or hanging with, you know, with their other donor type friends and they were talking about what you were doing, could you trust them to remember your, what your campaign is about and say it in a simple way? This sentence does pass that test, um, but it's actually a, a, a deceptively uh, difficult test sometimes. Campaign vision should be charismatic. What we mean by that is when you hear it, you want, you feel like you want to get behind it. So uh, put a man on the moon. This is the best uh, example of this, obviously not a fundraising campaign, but an idea that just inspires and rallies people as soon as you hear it. Uh, it a good campaign vision should sound credible. The moonshot is a great example because that's just on the very, that was just on the very outer edges of what was credible. Um, and a campaign vision should not sound like it's so lofty or so overblown that, that it's just like, that doesn't, that doesn't make sense or it doesn't, it's not going to work. So here are some of those concrete and pragmatic visions sometimes work really well. If, if the vision is, you know, we're going to, double the number of children that we serve over a period of five years. That's big. It could be a moonshot for you. Um, but it could be, you know, you, you can show how it's credible. How do you get to this kind of language? Um, something we like to do, we often do this with uh, campaign steering committees or board members early in a campaign case process, is actually start with these little uh, fill-in-the-blank sentence starters. So uh, this campaign is all about blank or uh, more of a challenge framing. We must X, Y, Z, what, what must we do? Or what, what is this moment? It's time to, 
Uh, so we'll actually take time at a steering committee meeting and put these on the screen and give people, you know, two or three minutes and just go around the room and hear what people say. It's always, always super interesting. Um, people will take these in very different directions. Uh, they will struggle with it. They will uh, appreciate your work more because they see how hard it is to do. Um, and usually one or two people will come up with something that's really good and that maybe you wouldn't have thought of because it's simpler or it's more kind of from their perspective versus from the staff perspective. So try this. It's easy. It's fun. And uh, uh, it's always full of uh, a couple surprises. So campaign visions, um, probably the most important part of the campaign case. The third and final portion of the campaign case that we want to really focus on is the plan section. And uh, if you think about the vision as more of the emotional, aspirational piece of what you're saying you're going to do, um, your kind of inspiring hook, the plan is the sort of concrete rationale that supports that. The mission, if the vision is to go to the moon, the plan is, okay, how are we actually going to get to the moon? And you need both of these working together. Because plans and projects uh, make a campaign real. They build confidence, they give your campaign concreteness and structure, um, and they, they build on that momentum of your vision so that it feels like it's actually possible and it's actually gonna happen. So in this six-part structure, vision and plan really work together. Uh, we like to think about these as kind of like, context and impetus are kind of the why, why should we care about this? Uh, and the vision and plan are the what. What are we going to do, and how does it? How is it actually credible that we're going to we're going to accomplish it? And you can't really have one without the other. So let's look at how they work together. This is uh, I like to try to block this out in a very simple structure so that the the kind of conceptual structure or organization of your campaign is really clear. So if the vision this is be for a school uh, that we worked with, the vision was to expand our capacity to serve 500 more students by 2020. And the plan to support that, so, so that vision is all about, this is a, was a, um, a, an urban school where essentially all the students are on full scholarship and essentially all of them go to college. It's just a great success story for, uh, uh, for urban education. So the idea that we could expand this to reach so many more kids is to, that is really, really powerful. And then the plan is concrete stuff. That means we need to expand the middle school wing. It means we need to endow some of our faculty positions. Um, means we, need, we need to endow scholarships because almost none of these kids are, pay, are paying uh, much tuition. So if we want to grow, we need endowment to support that. So the vision makes it exciting. The plan makes it real. Uh, sometimes, when the vision is especially lofty, so let's say you're a voluntary health uh, association like the Alzheimer's Association, uh, you know, or focused on, you know, one of the organizations organized around a, a disease or a health cause, you know, the vision might be super lofty, like we're going to achieve a world without this disease. Um, then your plan elements might be a little bit more like the pillars of a strategic plan. That might mean, you know, we're going to achieve the vision by investing in research for a cure, by providing care and support for families today, by investing in advocacy for public funding, and by building awareness. So those aren't quite as concrete as like, we're gonna build a new middle school wing. Um, they kinda, if the vision is a little bit loftier, the plan elements might be a little bit higher level as well, a little more strategic. You might even frankly have a third level of hierarchy underneath this where you have you know, building out this research grant making program and building out this, you know, patient navigator program for families. And our advocacy piece might have three components that are, you know, federal level and state level and building, you know, grassroots. Like, so if your campaign is especially lofty, you might actually need a three level structure within your plan section. Um, the other way, thing to think about here is that in most campaigns, if you have multiple projects, you kind of need to think about each project as having its own case um, and, and being able to stand on its own. So, uh, and it's a good, frankly, it's a good exercise to try to imagine that each project within a campaign could tell its own story and almost have its own uh, vision and appeal. So, uh, when you're thinking about project cases, 
you want to think about the vision and appeal for each project almost like it's a standalone case. Uh, so if you have a campaign vision statement, you might also have a vision statement for every project. Uh, you need to provide, uh, project cases are typically where you go into more detail, so you typically want to provide enough detail there to give your donors, fundraisers, and volunteers confidence. It does, and, and what that threshold means will depend on who your audience is, um, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, point of clarification, this comes up a lot. Yes, you can launch your campaign while the projects are still being defined. Uh, this is actually quite quite common. Um, it's okay to let people know early in a campaign that the details are still taking shape, um, especially when you're talking to the donors and volunteers who are closest to you. The level of detail you need to share will depend on the audience and the project. So, uh, you know, if you're, let's say you're a food bank and your campaign is to build a new uh, home for the food bank, Food bank donors are usually pretty arm's length. They're not there every day. They don't know your services that directly. They're community civic leaders who care about what you do, but they're not really into the nitty gritty details very often. So for that kind of campaign, the project detail might be a one pager. If you're an independent school where the donor audience is your parents, they are on your campus every day. They know everything there is to know about your school. Uh, a good portion of them think they could run it better than you do. Um, that is a high information audience. They're going to need to know everything you can possibly tell them about the project. So understand that the level of detail depends on the audience. So, you know, stepping back, big picture, what we're doing with project cases is trying to make each project feel important, feel exciting, feel like it's part of a cohesive whole underneath that vision. Some questions that you might get as you build out project cases are, you know, how will this project be sustained? If we're growing to reach 500 more students, um, you know, how, how will, are, will we be prepared to uh, support that from an operating standpoint? Uh, what will the impacts and outcomes be? At the project level is typically where donors will ask these more challenging, kind of like rational challenge type questions, like I need to see the business plan for this, or uh, I, you know, I need to see, this and when they ask you these kinds of questions is actually a good sign because it means that they are bought in and they're starting to like kick the tires on the idea. It means they're fundamentally interested in the project and they're trying to sort of rationalize to themselves that it would be a smart investment on their part. So they're probably emotionally bought in, but they're doing the rational challenging. That often happens at the project level. Um, you know, these kinds of questions, why does it cost so much? What's the construction timeline? These kinds of things. Certain donors will want to know this. Um, it's never clear to me whether they actually need the answer to be a certain way or if they just want to know that you have an answer and that you've done your homework. Again, this is one of those rational challenge type questions that is kind of just them making sure that if they do give, that they're making a smart decision. Uh, you know, if you're raising money for endowment, you might get questions around that. How does that work? What difference will it make? Uh, some donors already understand endowment. Others need endowment 101. So if you're, th that might be an important part of your project case. It's, it's just explaining how does endowment work? Why is it important? What is it, you know, why is it an important part of sustaining our mission over time? Uh, I mentioned you can share uh, project cases and projects in the campaign before all those uh, uh, details are in place. So how do you do that? Um, this comes up a lot, especially in the early stages of campaigns. And, you know, most savvy donors understand that plans evolve, plans change. You might be coming to them early. That's actually sometimes a sign of respect that they feel like a real insider. They're getting to look at the campaign vision and case before it's really even fully built out. So it's okay. But you still need to give them enough to be able to kind of make the project feel inspiring and real and credible. So one way we often do this is just to try to think about the benefits. If you can't talk about the details, talk about the benefits. So let's say you're building a new theater. What are the top five benefits for this theater? Uh, it's going to ensure that our community has great theater for decades to come. Uh, this was from a campaign where the old theater was literally about to fall down. Um, so building a new theater was legitimately a question of the continued survival of this institution. So first benefit, it's going to keep the theater running. 
second, it's going to enable us to double our educational programs because we're going to build a bunch more space. Um, we can't show you the blueprints. We can't show you the exact square footage, but this is a guiding principle of the design process is that we're going to look to double space for educational programs. It's going to take our stagecraft to a whole new level because we're going to build in all the you know most up-to-date production technologies and lighting and sound and back, you know, uh, back of house stuff. So again, we don't need to show people the itemized list of every you know lighting can that you're going to buy, but you can capture the benefit. It's going to give our audiences a much more comfortable experience. The chairs are going to be nicer, the bathrooms are going to be nicer, uh, and it's going to offer a better working environment for our artists, so that we can attract more you know national talent, national directors, uh, actors you've seen on TV to come uh, come be part of productions in our community. So again. You don't have to show a blueprint if you are clear enough early on about what the benefits are that you're going for. One question that will come up when you look at vision and plan is, is your campaign more vision driven or plan driven? And there, either way can work. We've worked on campaigns that are very vision driven, where the big idea is really clear, the supporting projects all tie into that, but we've worked on campaigns where I feel like if you even changed out a bunch of the projects, the vision would still be the same. That's a vision-driven campaign. If you change out the, camp the projects or tweak the projects, would the vision still be the same? That's a good clue that it's a vision-driven campaign. A plan-driven campaign is much more driven, as you might imagine, by more practical needs around specific projects, and the vision is more about just finding a way to wrap those together so they feel like they're part of the same story. Um, so this is just, there's no right answer here. It's just something good to recognize about your campaign. It should shape the way your communications are balanced. Do you spend more time on the vision versus the plan to shape what you lead with in conversations? So let's talk about getting ready to prepare to, to communicate a campaign case. Um, this is an idea I'm going to be building out into a, one of those articles or blog posts that uh, I mentioned earlier. You actually probably need three cases over the life of a typical campaign. Uh, you need a quiet phase case, usually some kind of mid-campaign refresh of the case, and then a public phase case. And each of these is doing something different. At the beginning of the campaign, you're defining the vision, you're establishing your overall messaging and rationale, uh, you're basically building out those six elements and weaving them together into a cohesive message. You're activating your volunteer leaders and you're supporting early cultivation. So um, that activating volunteer leaders is probably actually the most important part. I think at the for the first case work that you do in a campaign, you think of the audience as the donors, but the actual most important audience for that is your board because you're trying to get that campaign steering committee energized and excited to go out and ask when you're you know at the beginning of the campaign you're thinking about the first 20 20 or 50 people you're going to ask at the very top of your gift table um, honestly those solicitations are going to be driven by volunteer relationships and if your volunteer if your board members are fired up and they feel great about the case they will win those people over and you will succeed in those solicitations um, so the first audience for a case is actually your board and your volunteer leaders. Once you get past those first, you know, once you go from like the top 20 donors to the top, the next 200, that like middle of the gift table where it's all the middle major donors, that's often a good time to step back and refresh and revisit your campaign case, revisit your messaging. Look at those first 20 donors. What did you learn from those conversations? Did they vibe on you know, the message as you put it out there? Did they resonate with different things? What did you learn from that early cultivation that would apply as you start thinking about the broader major gift cultivation? This is typically when you'll expand the suite of campaign materials as well, building out more print materials, revising a cultivation deck, possibly producing video, things like that often um, you invest much more in those in that mid-major section of the campaign. So it's often a good chance to step back, refresh. Um, often you're not, you're not throwing the whole thing out, but um, you might be pivoting a little bit. And then when you get to the public phase, it's really a whole new ballgame. You have to simplify your messaging down to a level that it can live in a, you know, in a very short format thing that's communicated uh, through email, through, through direct mail on your website. 
you know, all the, all the quiet phase stuff is driven in, in, in conversations. So you have that time and space. In the public phase, the idea has to work on the page in a one-page letter, you know. So that means simplifying your messaging. Often you're, you're looking for new creative ideas here, new ways to take your campaign message and turn it into different, turn it into different creative campaigns that you can run across your different communications channels. So that's, you know, all these three, these three cases, they're, they're all con sort of continuous with each other and they all evolve and they, they, they fit together. But it really does, um, it's not just like one case and then you're done. So uh, one thing we like to share in this is just a, what's a typical process for developing a campaign case? And a, a good process here might be to think about it in terms of a year. Obviously, you can do it in less, you can take more time, situations vary. Uh, but often the first half of that is really about doing preliminary case development, producing a test case that you then test in campaign feasibility study, or even just informally by testing it with your board, with some, some close donors who you trust. You want to do some initial testing of, of a preliminary case before you've invested too much time or money in building it out. And then you, you learn from that, you refine your campaign plans, you take it to your board, you say, okay, we know what this campaign is, let's get the green light to move forward. Once you get that, then there's usually another push of case development and communications activity where you're refining your case based on what you learned in the study or in that early testing phase. You're building out the campaign identity and branding, the name or tagline, uh, the visual identity, the logo or word mark, or however you're going to tie it to your existing branding. You're building out the brand standards. And you're producing that first set of major donor cultivation materials that you're going to use in the quiet phase of the campaign. So that's usually in the first six months after you've had a campaign approved. And then uh, alongside that, you might also do message coaching for your volunteer leaders, for your steering committee, for your board. Um, and you might put together a, a communications plan for the quiet phase of the campaign. So this is typically how, you know, this is just a, a standard typical type scenario. One question that comes up in that is what materials should you produce? And I'm not gonna get into this because we have a whole separate webinar on this. Uh, we did last year, it's called Fundraising Materials That Work. Uh, there's a link to it that you'll get with these slides. Um, you can see a little screen cap of it where we went through an exercise and we did different types of campaigns. We showed a bunch of different types of materials and then we went through an exercise of how would you spend a given campaign um, production, material production budget for different, uh, different budgets, different sizes of campaigns. So I did that with uh, Pat Chestnut, who you see on the slide uh, on the screen there. And Pat and I just kind of talked through all that together. All right, so here we are. Um, let's take some time for questions. Actually, hear you. All right, uh, Emily or Molly, do we have uh, questions that came in? We do. So our first question is, can you please speak to how a case for support will look different for an organization going through a campaign versus an organization needing a general case for support? Sure, okay. Um, so that's a, that's a really important question. It was one of the things that I wanted to use up at the beginning of this presentation to frame it. Um, let me just jump back to that, see if I can jump back to that slide. Um, it will typically, uh, what's different is that, uh, you're, that typically the vision is bigger, it's more time limited and focused on the urgency of the moment, and the projects need to be very compelling. So, uh, and you see that again in kind of this, this break breakdown here. You tend to double down on making it extra urgent, extra visionary, and extra substantive in terms of the plan. Um, and, and, and you really have to ask, your, ask yourself that question, that vision question of what's going to be different, and get that to a level where donors can genuinely picture that in their heads. Great. Thank you. Our next question is, what is the climate like for institutions that were planning on starting a campaign in 2020? Is the consensus to continue on or pause for a moment? Yeah, uh, so we've been talking about this a lot in the uh, COVID specific webinars and resources that I mentioned earlier and uh, we can 
you should definitely check those out on our uh, Campbell and Company webpage. We have a COVID resource page that has a number of uh, resources that really dig into this. Um, just to give you the short version, we are seeing a lot of organizations delay or pause campaigns to let some time play out or extend the time frame of campaigns. We're not seeing yet all that many organizations outright canceling because, you know, sort of if they had a reason to do, if they needed to do the campaign to begin with, nothing has probably changed that. It's just more a matter of timing. So we're seeing many more delays than outright cancellations. We are seeing some, from a case standpoint, we're seeing organizations that might rethink the balance of projects within their campaign. It might be if you have a capital project that is you're, everyone's really excited about, but it's not mission critical, you might push that off to the next campaign and double down on scholarships or endowment or program support or something much more immediate. So, you know, the balance of projects within campaigns might change, the messaging might change to really uh, resonate with where people are emotionally and, uh, and in their philanthropic thinking right now. Um, but, you know, uh, w most organizations that we're interacting with are trying to find trying to adapt and find their way forward, um, except for those that are just, you know, so affected um, because of, you know, if they rely on ticket revenue and visitor revenue, you know, or, or if they're a food bank and they're too busy to even talk to us right now, um, you know, there are some organizations that are so affected they need to really just stop entirely, but uh, most other folks are, are trying to pivot. Thanks. Our next question is, if the board is not excited about the vision your organizational leader has articulated, what are some strategies to address this? That's a really important question because if, uh, if the vision isn't working with your board, uh, gosh, it's hard to know how you could get a campaign off the ground or, or, or get past that. So this is why, you know, from a best practice standpoint, it's often recommended to have campaign uh, planning emerge out of strategic planning or, or institutional visioning. To be honest, we see organizations doing those in every possible sequence and combination at the same time. So if you didn't do it in the best practice way, don't worry, like not that many people are actually. Um, so I, I think if, that's, if, if you've identified that as the problem, that's great because Honestly, it can be a hard problem to identify. Sometimes when people don't understand the vision, they don't actually know how to articulate that to you. They'll just make nitty gritty or picky. Sometimes people make picky uh, complaints about details and projects and when what the actual problem is, is that they're not excited about the vision so, and, they, and they can't articulate that to you. So if you've already identified this as a problem, um, you're in pretty good shape because you can address it. You need to, you need to, uh, lean into the question with your board, um, put the vision question out uh, on the table. You may need to, to step back and actually take time to do visioning, to, to uh, do a properly facilitated consensus building process around um, institutional vision, philanthropic and campaign vision, uh, and you know, ask, invite board members into that conversation so that they see their fingerprints on the final result. So we actually have a whole uh, other uh, service area and some, some, some thought leadership resources coming out soon that are all about visioning. So uh, we hope we can share those with you soon. Uh, it's a super deep topic, but if you've identified that that's the problem, you're already, uh, you're already most of the way there. Thanks. Um, so I think we have time to squeeze in one last question. If we didn't get to your question, we'll make sure to follow up with you after the webinar to make sure it's addressed. So our last question is, what's the best way to build a case around a non-sexy building renovation? I mean, <laughs> I think building renovations are plenty sexy. I mean, I, I, I almost question the premise, to be honest, because um, I don't know. There are times when a big, flashy building, uh, new building campaign is the right thing for the right moment. I mean, I think about like 
pre great recession, there was all this like art sector, you know, d frankly, temple building going on these like elaborate museum and theater campaigns. Um, half of which they ended up sort of regretting because they built something they couldn't sustain after the re recession. So honestly, like, I, w I think a good meat and potatoes, you know, well developed, thoughtful, uh, smart uh, renovation plan where you can go to your donors and say, we looked at all the ways to do this. We could build a new building, but it's not smart. It's too expensive. It's not the best use of donor dollars. This is the smart way to solve our problem. This is the smart way to build for our future. Um, I think there's a ton of power in that, especially at a time when people want to know that resources are being used wisely. So to be honest, I love a good, you know, unsexy building renovation campaign that's really smart, really well thought through, and where you can legitimately say to your donors, we did the homework and this is the smartest way for us to proceed. That builds a ton of confidence, even if it's not like the flashiest thing to show renderings of. These are great questions. I hope there's more. If there are, I will uh, get back to you by email. Um, I just want to thank you again for joining today's session and again for the work that you're doing. I uh, hope everyone hangs in there. Stay safe. Reach out if you have questions. We're here for you. And keep an eye out for a sign up. We're going to start pushing out a ton of articles and blogs over uh, the rest of this year. We want you to receive those. Thank you so much and uh, talk to you soon.